Thank you. My first introduction to archaeology was at the age of nine, when living in southern Rhodesia. My cousin and I were curious about some stone walls and bits of pottery that we found on a copy and a rocky hill. Near our home, we took the pottery to the local museum in Salisbury and were told that it was really old. <laughs> Years later, at a boarding school in England, I was told that I couldn't read archaeology at university because I hadn't learned classical Greek. After being persuaded to become a medical student, I left school in 1951 and started at the old Royal Free Hospital in the Grays Inn Road. It was a dismal place, and I soon gave it up to go and work in a small art gallery where I learned the rudiments of cleaning pictures. While there, I heard about the course in archaeological technique at the Institute of Archaeology. I went to the Institute at St. John's Lodge in Regent's Park and was immediately bewitched by the building, the people in it, the park, and the nearness to the zoo. And I gleefully signed up to do the course for the year 1953-4. to four. It was run by Miss Getty, helped by Miss Starkey, and I suppose there were about 20 students. We learned how to reconstruct pots with glue, plasticine, and plaster of Paris. And we learned how to clean coins and coat them with the new preservative of polyvinyl. And I helped with Ian Cornell's soil analysis. <coughs> But better still, I was able to go to the lectures that were part of the diploma courses given by Gordon Child, Mortimer Wheeler, Max Mallorin, Kathleen Kenyon, and Frederick Zoyner. I have many good, bad, and amusing memories of this year at the old institute. One very bad moment was when Miss Geddy was showing some people around the cases of restored pots. She lifted the sloping glass lid of a case took the reconstructed pot out, but failed to put it far enough back in. Trying to be helpful, I held the lid open, then put it down, crushing the pot into small fragments. <laughs> As part of my training, I had to put it together again. <laughs> An amusing memory is of how the peacefully dozing students in the library would suddenly come to life when Wheeler strode into the building. <laughs> Because I had done science, I was specially interested in restoring skulls. The first one I did was a hyena skull from Anthony Sutcliffe's cave excavations in Devon. The next one was one of the plaster decorated skulls from Jericho, which had just been excavated. I was called upstairs to Miss Kenyon's room to talk to her about it. I was nervous as she seemed very dominating, <laughs> but the interview went well. However, Instead of leaving by the door I'd come in, I managed to walk across the room into a broom cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> On emerging from the cupboard, I remember her face, which was quite impassive, as she pointed to the right <laughs> I've always had an absolutely hopeless sense of direction. <laughs> During my summer term at the Institute, Zoina led several day trips, and we've heard about them from other people to see archaeological and geological sites around the south of England. It was at one of these trips to Swanscombe that I met my future husband, Peter Jewell, a physiologist interested in archaeology. <coughs> I suppose it was the hyena skull that gave me my first personal contact with Zoyner and with Anthony Sutcliffe, who had just finished his PhD under Zoyner, and who became a lifelong <coughs> colleague and friend. During the summer, at one interview with Zoyner, who was always very forthright in his speech, he told me I was wasting my time. I must go and get a degree in zoology and then come back and work with him. Later, I told him that Miss Geddy, who was retiring, said I should apply for her job. He merely replied, you will be wasting the ink. <laughs> Zoyner then proceeded to arrange for me to enroll at the Chelsea Polytechnic to do a three-year degree course in zoology and geology, which I duly began in the autumn term of 1954. But I kept close contacts with archaeology and the institute. In the summer of 1954, I went as a volunteer to St. Gerhard's Bronze Age excavation of Emporia on Chios. It was a marvelous experience. 
Michael and Betty Ventress were there, as was John Boardman and Richard Garnett, who were on a boat in the bay was pioneering underwater archaeology. Nancy Sanders may have been there at the same time also, but we don't remember each other there. Hello, 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 hello. The next three summers were also taken up with archaeology. In 1955, I went to Knossos to restore the human skulls from Sinclair's excavation for the anthropologists Jack Trevor and Bernard Campbell to measure, staying in the Villa Ariadne. In 1956, I went on a summer school in Orkney in Shetland, led by Gordon Child, the year before his death. And in 1957, I went on the excavation of Bronze Age Snail Down in Wiltshire, that was directed by Nick Thomas and Charles Thomas. While there, I got the results of my BSc, which enabled me to begin work on a PhD with Zoina in the autumn term. <coughs> Zoina was a rare polymath, and I always felt very privileged to be working under his guidance. His research since his arrival in England in 1934 had been mainly on integrating British and continental studies on the dating of the Quaternary. But I was fortunate in that he had recently become interested in mammalian remains, and even more recently in domestication, which is what I wanted to study. I had little choice in what I, what I was to take on. I was to take over the animal remains from three sites that were in the Institute waiting to be worked on and Zoina arranged for me and the collections to be moved to the osteology room at the Natural History Museum, where I spent the next four years trying to get some sort of scientific link out of the material from the widely different sites. From time to time, Zoina would drop in on me and give me pithy comments on what I was doing, and I also had appointments with him at the new institutes. On several occasions, he would have the material from the widely different sites. From time to time, Zoina would drop in on me and give me pithy comments on what I was doing. And I also had appointments with him at the new institute here in Gordon Square. But he hardly ever kept these appointments. On several occasions, he would emerge from his room after I'd been waiting for an hour or so to see him and say, I'm going to the Athenaeum. Give me a taxi. You can come with me, we'll talk, and then you can walk back. <laughs> <laughs> After I had the final manuscript of my thesis ready for him to read, he called me into his room, glared at me, and said, I spent three days reading this thing. <laughs> but he'd been through it very carefully, and I got my PhD after a useful oral with the paleontologist Bob Savage. Over those years, Zoina became almost a family friend. He came to my wedding with Peter Jewell in 1958, and he used to come to meals with us in our tiny house in Highgate. On one occasion, there was nowhere for him to sit because our first baby was asleep on the only armchair, and she couldn't be wakened because she would have screamed. I was very sad when he died at the age of 58 in 1963 the same year that his now classic book on the domestication of animals was published. That's all. Thank you.